um, and um, you have to accept that it's been it's recording. And then I'm going to share my screen so we can start the class. I'm gonna see where to share my screen. Here's my screen. Okay. And I will start my slideshow. Okay. So today we're gonna be discussing how to apply the ADA to avoid violations during design and construction. Or like we're basically, um, designing and when it gets filled, there shouldn't be any ADA violation. And um, so hang on, let me see if I can like, let's talk about muting everyone. How do I do this? Mute all. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to allow a little bit of time after the class for, um, for questions. If you have questions that you need me to answer, to answer, just put it on the chat if you, so you don't forget, but I'm, I'm happy to like, Unmute, so you can unmute yourselves if I at the end, so we can so we can answer the questions. Okay, so um, technically, okay. So the learning objectives will be we're going to little learn about the history of the ADA a little bit, um, and then some tips to pay attention to so there won't be any violations when when your buildings get built. And these are the what I'm going to cover today is about commercial buildings because residential buildings don't really fall under the ADA. So um, if you have any residential questions um, for fair housing and things, um, we can you know, take them offline and because um, this is beyond the scope of this class. So this is mainly just commercial projects. So in the, in the history of the ADA began in 1990 when the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed into law. And, um, and it was a civil rights law. So that means it's not a code. We think of, you know, we think of it as a code, but it's really a civil rights law. And it's got five titles or five areas where we should not discriminate against people with disabilities. The first one is employment. You can't discriminate against a person with disabilities. If they wanna come work for you, you have to give them the opportunity to interview. And if they're qualified, you should be able to hire them. Title, and then by the same token, if somebody's working for you, you can't fire them just because they become disabled. So that's title one. Title two is if you, um, if, the, if you're a, a state or local government that has programs or services that um, then you are required to provide those programs for, um, for people with disabilities. Title three is what we are gonna be talking about today. Title three of the ADA says public accommodations and commercial buildings have to be accessible. And that's what we'll, that's our discussion today. So it might come into play, title one and title two might come into play, but um, essentially title three is building access. So sometimes when you have to hire someone who's disabled, title one will come into play, but that's not what we deal with. And say, by the same token, the title, the entity, the state or local entity is a Title II entity, and they will hire us as architects to, to um, make their buildings accessible under Title III. Title IV is um, things like telecommunications that are the infrastructure of the websites, um, closed captions that you see on the TV or on TikTok now, <laughs> um, the little uh, anything like that's for the hearing impaired and visually impaired, the telecommunications infrastructure. Um, Title V um, are things that allow lawsuits. So basically, if you're if they know of an entity or an owner that does not is not following the, the ADA, then Title V allowed for lawsuits to be brought up under the different titles. Now you have to keep in mind that even though us architects are not technically responsible for ADA being adhered to, meaning like we're not called in the, on the lawsuit, they will bring us in because the, the owner will be brought in a, a lawsuit and then they'll just start blaming everyone. So we have to make sure we're doing our due diligence so that we don't get brought up in the lawsuit that um, under the ADA. But essentially it's for the right reasons, not to, avoid lawsuits, but it's kind of a little bit of both. So, okay. Um, in 1990 is when the law passed. In 1991, the guidelines on how to design title for Title III um, was, was published. 
And we'll be discussing a little bit about that because it's no longer in place. The 1991 guidelines are no longer in place because in 2004, they got rewritten by the US Access Board. And in 2010, they passed it um, into law. So it became the 2010 ADA standards for accessible design that became uh, mandatory in 2012. So in 2012, uh, March 15, 2012 is when it became mandatory. Um, and so a lot of times we don't, the contractors have a set way of doing things. And even, I even find some architects and civil engineers that still have the little notes from the 1991 version. So we have to pay attention to that. For example, um, a lot of contractors um, don't realize that the 54 inch reach range, so it used to be in 1991, the side reach range was allowed to be 54 inches high for the high and nine inches low for the low. So that means that that is the amount of reach within that a person with disabilities, what they thought could reach for something. But then they realize that that's a little bit too high. So they the new standard made it 48 inches. <clears throat> So I still see things that are mounted at 54 inches or 52 inches, um, and that's incorrect. So you have to make sure you understand that you're, if you have a detail that's showing that, or you know, or if you're doing CA, make sure that your contractor is aware that the, the laws did change and that that changed. So if you have a building that was built or um, that an, an element that it was installed before. March of 2012, then it's going to be considered a safe harbor. We don't, um, ADA doesn't like the word grandfathered, so they use the safe harbor is the same thing. So basically, if you have an element that was not modified um, and it's still 54 inches high for the reach range, but they never modified it and it's still in place since then, it's considered acceptable and compliant by the old standard. Um, because it's it, because the old standard allowed it. You're not required to move it unless you're going to replace it or modify it in some way. Reach ranges is one easy one, but then it, it also applies to the clearance around the toilet used to be allowed to be 36 inches when there was an obstruction next to it, like a sink or a lavatory next to it if it had a knee space. So, and it was allowed to be th three feet from the sidewall to the edge of the obstruction. The new standard requires that you have five feet. Now, keep in mind that there's a lot of dimensions in the standards that are similar. So you have a five foot, foot turning space, but it's different than the five foot clearance, minimum clearance at the water closet. So there are two different requirements, even though they have the same dimensions. So now we have um, a we we are required to have five feet clear at the water closet versus before it used to be three feet. So if you have a, a restroom that is that used to be that was built before March of 2012 and it met this little footprint, it looked like the, the floor plan in the 1991 standards, it is compliant and it, it can remain as is. If you start modifying the entire restroom, then it's a little bit different and more complicated. And I can give a class on alterations. It's way beyond the scope of this class. Just know that if you leave it alone, it's fine. If you don't, if you modify it, it might have to be brought up to compliance. So um, ask me uh, in private or whatever if you need me, or um, I'll be happy to look at your floor plan. Same thing with things that didn't change, but the graphics changed. So it was um, the rear wall grab bar used to say that it had to be 36 inches wide, um, just like now, but, but they had this graphic that was really not clear because it, it showed you a 24 inch grab bar solid with solid lines. And then it told you it dotted the lines 12 inches on either side. So people thought you were allowed to have a 24 inch grab bar in the rear wall and you can't. So they modified, the graphics. So now you, so it's clear that you have to have a 36 inch grab bar. Plus, it doesn't relate to the sidewall. It didn't relate to the sidewall on you know, on the old standard either. The ANSI, the, there's another standard that is part of the building code. The model code 
is the ICC ANSI standard, A117.1. That one does say that the rear wall grab bar is required to be six inches away from the sidewall, but not the ADA. So you have to pay attention to that because that you're gonna, your contractor might get it wrong if, if, if he doesn't build it per the ADA and sometimes it happens. Okay, so understanding that the standards and the reasons why the um, requirements are, so um, you're gonna have to not answer the phone. Okay, sorry. Um, so there, there's a standard that says that if you have gaps or openings along the accessible route, you require um, if they shouldn't be more than half an inch wide. So if you they show us a grading, right? So on the figure, the the elongated openings are for a grate, and so of course a grate um, in in the parking space is obviously wider than half an inch. But it's not only grates. We have to understand why the standard happened. This standard happened because the casters of a wheelchair might get stuck in an opening. And it could be openings could be grates, but it could also be expansion joints that are made out of cedar and they rot away. And when they rot away, then they become, they, they leave a two inch gap or three inch gap. Or you have um, pavers that have the grout lines that are more than half an inch wide. So you have to keep in mind that even though the, the little figure showed us a grate, it was, um, it's actually um, openings in general. Okay, <clears throat> another thing that happens that I see a lot are curb ramps. Curb ramps are not exactly ramps. They are, and they're not. Curb ramps are ramps that are ramps that have that cross a curb. So if you have a curb on the site and you cut a, a ramp on it so that you can go from one level to another, then this is a curb ramp. But a curb ramp, um, it tells you 406 is a curb ramp section. And they tell you that it only requires to comply with these sections here, 405. 405 is a ramp. So 405.2 is a slope. 405.3 is a cross slope. 405.4 is the ground surface. It shouldn't be, it should be slipper, um, not slippers, it should be slip resistant, sorry, and stable. And then 405.5 is the clear width. Those are, and then of course it shouldn't retain water. Those are the only things that they need to worry about when they design a, a curb ramp. But because we're so used to the idea that, and I'm, if you're not familiar, I'll, I'll let you know, but if you have a regular ramp that is no more than six feet long or six inches tall, then you're not required to have handrails. So the civil engineer is, always making sure that their curb ramp is no longer than a six feet, or when you do a one to 12, it's six inches tall, because they think that if they make it longer, they're gonna require handrails. So what happens, first of all, handrails are not required in a curb ramp, no matter how long it is or how tall it is. If you have a, a curb that is taller than six inches, and you only make your curb ramp six feet, you're gonna make a very steep ramp. So if you have an eight inch curb, you're gonna need, you know, if you do it a one to 12 slope, you're gonna need an eight foot long ramp. So if they, so I always find that when you tell me, it really, the, the length of the ramp is not important. It's really the slope. So the slope is required, the one to 12 slope is required, not the length. So the length doesn't matter. Okay, so let's talk about doors. This one's something that came up um, recently. So I'm gonna tell you um, the definition of doors. The doors that are required to comply with the ADA are ones that provide user passage. Now, I always understood user passage to be the user being um, a person with disabilities. So a if a 30 inch by 48 inch space, which is what the blue space, which is the amount of space a wheelchair requires, if they can go through the door and beyond the door, then it's user passage. So that means that that door that they're going through has to comply with the section 404. And I'll tell you about it in a minute. So in a hotel, um, this is a picture of a, of a guest room in a hotel. 
that's not re that's not accessible. That doesn't require mobility features. But in a hotel, you are required to make all the doors in the guest room without mobility features comply. Um, so that means that every door that allows use of passage is required to be 32 inches clear. So what I'm showing you is this toilet that I am pointing to does, doesn't appear to be big enough for a wheelchair, right? So you would assume that there's, it doesn't provide user passage the way that I just defined it. Well, I was wrong about that. So I'm sharing with you so that you can make, don't make the same mistake. User passage is anyone that goes through the door. If a person who's walking can go through the door, it's providing user passage. That means that that, that little toilet room doesn't, it's not required to be accessible, but the door is required to be 32 inches clear. Now, don't ask me why exactly, but that's what the access board told me. So I, you know, so just make sure that you make all your doors in a guest, in a hotel guest room that is wide enough or not wide enough. So that, uh, that usually people will go through to go to the other side, no matter who it is, um, that has to be 32 inches clear. So beyond that, when it requires a, a mobility, when, when a, a person with disabilities will need to use the door, um, then you require to have ma maneuvering clearances. A maneuvering clearance is the clearances that are required to open the door. So approach the door, um, grab the door handle, open the door and go through the door. So section 404 gives you different different um, door maneuvering clearance figures. So you have, and the little arrow shows you what you're, what you're looking at. The set, you know, figure A shows you a forward approach pull side. Um, letter B shows you a forward approach push side. And letter C also shows you a forward approach push side, but with a door that require, that has a closer and a latch. Now I wanna show you what what the differences are. Each one has a little bit of a difference requirement. So a, a forward approach pull side will require an 18 inch minimum on the latch side. A forward approach push side, if it doesn't have a closer and a latch, will only require 48 inches of depth plus the width of the door. And then the forward approach push side with a closer and a latch requires 48 inches of depth plus 12 inches on the latch. So that's that's in order to maneuver. And in each scenario, whether you're approaching it on a hinge side, latch side, side, front forward, there's a whole bunch of different little figures that you'll have to get familiar with when you're designing what maneuvering clearances you need. So one of the things that that we have to keep in mind is if you don't, <clears throat> if you don't dimension the maneuvering clearance or the distance at the latch side, then it, get, it could become a violation in the field. So this two changing rooms um, have doors that are swinging in. So when I'm inside, I'm going to have a forward approach push, I mean, pull side, which requires a minimum of 18 inches on the latch side. So this one, the first one on the top shows you one that appears to be enough clearance to not be a violation. But on the other one, there's a column that was that's not on the on the first one. So the, the door now is a little bit closer to the lavatory and it's not dimensioned. So I always say, be careful when you don't dimension it. It could be a general note, it could be a, a typical detail, but you really need to dimension it for two reasons. First reason is you wanna make sure that you have enough clearance. The second reason is because that little lavatory symbol is just a symbol. What if I specify something that's deeper or smaller or, you know, it's a different configuration, then, it, you know, just because it shows it properly in my drawing doesn't mean that that's the way it's going to be installed. And that's what happened here. So what happened here was that they didn't show me the dimension. The door was too close to the lavatory and I, I ha they had to tear up the wall and the tile and all that and it was a mess. 
So make sure you dimension your, um, your approach. When I go to the field and I dimension it's less than 18 inches, um, then it's wrong and they have to redo it. So, um, and they had to have the 60 inch clear also. So you have to, the 18 inches plus your 60 and all of that rectangle has to be clear of any obstruction. So this happened in a, um, in one of my projects that I inspected. So they, cre they, they, drew, they built the little single user restroom. The lavatory, I mean, the lavatory was, 40 inches from the wall. So even though they had plenty of room on the, on the latch side for 18 inches, there was the lavatory that didn't give you the 60 inch clear. And so what happens, so this is that actually the drawing. So they, they um, well, this is kind of backwards, but that's okay. So they had the 18 inches, just believe me, they did. <laughs> and then they didn't have the clearance from the edge of the lavatory to the door, which had to be 60 inches. Plus the fact that this already had 60 inches here. So really, they really couldn't move the lavatory any closer or away from the door because then it would be in the way of the, of the water closet. So this one was a little tricky. Luckily, they had enough room to swing the door out. And that's what we did. We actually swung the door out. So now you, don't, you didn't need 60 inches. All you needed was 48 inches, which they were able to achieve. Um, and they were, um, and we built it correctly. So that was the solution we had. Um, so that one was a, a lucky one that they had enough room to swing the door out. Um, okay. So there are certain times when doors have um, an obstruction or it's built in a thick wall. And so there is a provision for maneuvering clearances at recessed doors. So what they say is that if you have an object or an obstruction, whether it be a wall or an element, and it's less than eight inches or eight inches or less next to the latch side, then you can use that edge, the face of the obstruction for your maneuvering clearance. So it's considered recessed. So something like this, where you have a <clears throat> waste a waste receptacle next to the door, but it's less than eight inches. So we can use the front of the waste receptacle as your maneuvering, part of your maneuvering clearance. So it's, so it's, it's allowed to be there. Okay, um, doors that are, the doors also, they're installed in toilet compartments also have to comply with the maneuvering clearance um, as long as they're not, it, unless they're in this configuration. This configuration shows you a side approach to the, um, to the opening and it could be 42 inches instead of whatever it is that they need it to be. I'll show you in a minute. So it, essentially, the, if you have a, an end stall compartment, you need to, and then it sw the door swings out, you need to have your 18 inches on the pool side. So what typically you are allowed to, pull, to push the door in or swing the door in as long as you have 56 inches of clearance at the water closet here. So you are, so it's typically big enough. So right now it's seven foot nine. So if, if you took seven foot nine and you got and you swung the door in, that would be plenty of room for the water closet and the door. So that's one thing to keep in mind is also when you're approaching the, the toilet compartment. This one was a little bit tricky. It, it's a little bit complicated because it's, um, they were swinging the door so that the hinge, so that the latch was near the wall and they we would have to follow this configuration, which is a hinge side approach, which requires 36 inches of clearance, not 18 inches. So I just told them to swing the door the other way because really it doesn't tell you where the hinge is, they just tell you that the opening has to be four inches from the corner, um, the opposite corner of the toilet. So you can swing the door the other way. One of the other things that you wanna keep in mind in doors is the maneuvering clearance has to be flat. It has to be a 2% in all directions. So that rectangle for the maneuvering has to be. Plus when you put a ramp, uh, a ramp, a regular ramp, not a curb ramp, does require a landing, a flat landing at the top and the bottom. 
So when you have this condition, this person, they thought, okay, well, we're just going to put a ramp at the door because the, the finished floor is higher than the, than the ground floor. So where are they going to be approaching? So we'll just put a ramp and no big deal. But if you think about it, if I'm going to be on a wheelchair going up the ramp and I'm going to reach that door handle to open it, let's pretend that I can do that. Okay. Let's say somehow I got on that ramp and I'm reaching for the door handle and then I'm somehow I'm able to open the door somehow. And then when I, when I let go of the door handle so I can go through, I'm going to roll down the ramp. So that's why we need a flat area for, and that's why it's called a landing where I land, I reach for the door handle so that I won't roll down the ramp or the slope. So there's obviously there's other other things that you want to look at. Okay, so those are doors and um, violations and doors. Proper maneuvering and um, proper knee and toe clearance is also something that I see in the field that gets misunderstood. One this figure shows you what a toe clearance looks like underneath a sink or a drinking fountain or a table or something. Anything that you have to be underneath to, to reach. Um, that there requires knee and toe clearance. What confuses people is the six inch maximum. So this figure is not a construction figure. This figure is just de defining what is toe clearance. So in the, the definition of toe clearance is an area that is nine inches tall and six inches beyond uh, an obstruction that is considered toe clearance. And, it, and a toe clearance needs to be between 17 to 25 inches below the obstruction to, to be able to reach. And I'll show you what that means. So this, this is um, the drawing I, I get a lot where people think they have to, or architects have to dimension the, those dimensions, six inches maximum from the back wall. But if you notice, this figure has a, a cut line right it has it's telling you there's we don't care where the back wall is where you mount that uh, that counter it doesn't matter to us it's the toe clearance is defined as being in front not in the back so it, there's no relationship between the toe clearance and the back wall it's just a definition okay and my my client actually gave me this my client drew this for me and said is, you know, we can have a little rat's nest or a little house for a mouse um, beyond that. It doesn't really matter. It's really what happens in the front. Okay, so that six inches is just a definition. It's not a, it's not a requirement for you to, it's not a construction dimension. One of the things that keep in mind is that pedestal sinks don't have toe clearances because there's no, you don't have that, that nine inches of height and Usually they're not 17 inches minimum for the for the toes. So you're not um, you should never in install a pedestal sink for an accessible restroom. So back to uh, the toe clearance, then we have a knee clearance requirements. These are dimensions that you need to worry about for construction. So the 27 inches minimum height, vertical height for the knees. You are required to have a clearance of eight inches at the top and 11 inches at the bottom. Plus remember the 11 inches minimum plus your six inches of toe clearance is your 17 inches. Okay, so, so basically when they give me, sorry, when they give me this drawing, they don't give me the requirements for a knee clearance. They only gave me that six inches and the nine inches so when it gets built in the field, they don't have the eight inch knee clearance that's required because it wasn't dimensioned. They were worried about the toe clearance dimension, which isn't really necessary to dimension, um, but it's, um, they forgot to put the, um, the knee clearance ones. So this one's a little bit better. Um, it's not great because I'm gonna show you why. Um, eight inches, it, you should always, dimension with your minimums, okay? So if they give you eight inch minimum as a dimension, don't say eight inches because there's no tolerances. And I'm gonna talk about that later, but there needs to be a tolerance for construction mistakes. So make, make it nine inches or make it eight and a half inches or something. And then this one, and I'm, I'm gonna critique this because I drew it so I can critique it. <laughs> so, um, so 
this one says 11 inches and six inches, which is exactly the amount you need for the minimum, right? So this is a problem. It becomes a problem later, and I'm going to show you why. So this is all these are minimum requirements, eight inch minimum, nine inch minimum, this one's six inches maximum. But again, we don't really care about that number so much because it could be beyond, it could be deeper than that, or, but it's just not considered tilt clearance, it's just airspace. So then this is kind of the way it looks when it's built, right? So one of the things that's important to note is that there's knee and toe clearance, and then that allows you to be able to reach over an obstruction. So it's one of the reasons why we have a knee clearance and the ability to go forward is for us to be able to reach over an, that obstruction to something. So there is a requirement for um, how high you wanna make something beyond that obstruction to mount it. For example, a soap dispenser at a lavatory that's an obstruction. I'm reaching over the obstruction to get to that soap dispenser. So I really need my, my knee clearance and my toe clearance in place. Most of the time I don't get a dimension for those. I get dimensions for the, for the knee clearance, but I don't get a dimension for how high those elements are mounted to the back wall. So most of the time they're too high. So you really do have to keep in mind where, um, to dimension these or at least make a note of how high they should be. So that way it, the reach range is met. So the reason why it's also important to keep in mind the knee and toe clearance is because where a high forward reach is over an obstruction, the clear floor space shall extend beneath the element for a distance not less than the required reach depth over the obstruction. I read that to you because it's important for you to understand what it means. Now I'm gonna explain it. The, the minimum requirement for a, for a knee toe clearance is 17 to tw um, 17 inches, okay? And a lot of people, they just, that's what they give me. If you do that, if you give me 17 inches and you, and you because you thought that that six inches had to be sacred and they can't go beyond that, you put a blocking on there to keep me from going beyond six inches. Now you have to keep in mind what I'm reaching for. So if I'm reaching for that faucet, that faucet is beyond that blocking. Okay, this is a better example. That faucet is, has to be in line with the clear floor space below. So the reach to, to reach that faucet I have to have the same amount of space at the floor below. So this figure is probably going to give me a problem because there's a blocking in my way and I have to reach over the obstruction farther than 17 inches. Okay, so that's where that blocking, this one may not be such a problem because it looks like it's beyond, but it's, but we also need to make sure we, we're dimensioning it and they didn't dimension it. This is what happened here. What happened here, I have a faucet, even if it's um, automatic, okay? If an automatic faucet, you still have to have the ability to reach for the sensor. So um, the sensor, let's pretend that the sensor was 21 inches or even 20 inches. So if it was 20 inches away from the edge, I'm gonna have to have 20 inches on the floor. And these people only gave me eight, 11 inches. So they didn't even meet the 17 inches Re, um, minimum that they needed, but let's pretend it was 17 inches. That wouldn't have been enough for me to be able to reach. So keep in mind when you're when you're designing for toe, knee and toe clearances, you have to do both the the knee and toe clearance and the, the ability to reach. So um, to make that the same number or more. Vertical diaper counters are a little bit of a problem because their handle most of the time. Is, is higher than 48 inches on the reach range. It, it used to be, you know, like this one is 54 inches high, which was allowed for a side reach, but not anymore. So when you're designing, try to, um, try to not design vertical diaper counters because they're, they're usually not gonna give you the reach range. And if you make them too low, they won't give you the knee clearance that you need to get underneath. 
One of the other things that you want to keep in mind is when you do a side reach, that was a forward reach, right? We talked about forward reach. This is a side reach. When you're, when you're um, reaching over an obstruction in a side approach, you are required to have the obstruction no higher than 34 inches maximum. And, um, and so this one, this one is the height was fine, but it was 30 inches away from the edge and it only allows you 24 inches from the edge. So outlets are a little bit tricky because um, most of the time we design our counters 24 inches deep, plus you have your backsplash, which could be another 34 inches, I mean, three fourths of an inch. So um, in this case, it, the, it's just too far away. 30 inches is too far away. But in this case, they actually, um, oh, I didn't show you anything that they had to reach for. Well, the faucet. So this one didn't have a knee, a knee clearance, but let's pretend that it didn't need a knee clearance and you could reach over an obstruction. This, this was a 36 inch high sink. So it's altogether wrong, but, um, but just as, a, as an example, this was 36 inches high sink, which could not, you could not use a side approach to reach any of those things. So if you had a, a paper towel dispenser or a soap dispenser or a faucet, it's the counter's too high and it's not allowed to be um, used for a side reach. All right, a pastor, a priest, and a rabbi walk into a bar because the bar is a protruding object. So um, it's just a little joke here. Um, the protruding object rule is for visually impaired people. So visually impaired um, or blind people, uh, the way they're taught to navigate their environment is by using a cane, a white cane. And they tap their cane to detect objects along their route or along their circulation path. That, that cane can only detect objects that are mounted below 27 inches. So anything that's above 27 inches and below 80 inches is going to be a hazard for them unless they are only four inches deep. So some of the things that, you know, in this picture shows you an exterior condition, which also works like branches. If, if two, tree branches are below 80 inches, they're going to be a protruding object because a person who's blind will not be able to see it. And that sign, if it's, if it's above 27 inches and deeper than four inches, they're going to hit themselves because they can't detect it. So this is a, a couple of examples of you have your protruding objects in along a corridor um, or along a, a circulation path to the door that TV monitor is um, I'm not showing you the whole door, but there's a door on my circulation path, and that TV monitor is protruding more than four inches um, and below 80. This is all, another example. So a circulation path is not a, a corridor. Okay, a circulation path means anywhere that a blind person will walk is their circulation path. So this is a, vest, a little vestibule, a little area between two restrooms and you have a drinking fountain that's in, in between. So if I'm blind and I go to the first door and it says men's room, I'm gonna tap my cane to the, on the wall to get to the other door. And before I get to that door, I'm gonna hit myself with that high drinking fountain. So that's a protruding object. So the way that we fix it is we add a cane detection. I'll talk about that in a minute. Some other things, once I'm in the restroom, some other things that could be in my way would be paper towel dispensers that are deeper than, than four inches um, and obviously mounted higher than, than 27 inches. So those things are gonna be in my circulation path to the lavatory or to the door or to whatever, and that's gonna be a hazard. So this is how we can fix it. We can fix it by adding a cane detectable apron to the drinking fountain or a permanent waste paper basket underneath the paper towel dispenser. So those would be cane detectable elements that you can add to your, to your um, protruding objects. So I talked about this before. I don't know if you guys remember, I posted this picture and I said, don't create more problems while you're trying to fix them. And this is kind of why. So what's wrong with this picture is every drinking fountain was given a cane detectable apron so that means that now all the low drinking fountains that required a knee space now doesn't don't have it because it's 
the, the cane detection is below 27 inches now. Beside, and then also there's another issue. Drinking fountains are required, the, the wheelchair drinking fountain is required to have a 30 by 48 inch space centered on the drinking fountain. Not everything has to be centered, but this one, if you read the little, the little figure, the little wording, the clear floor space has to be centered on the unit. So if you have a high and a low drinking fountain right next to each other, then if you put a cane detectable apron on the high one that's lower than 27 inches, then it's going to become um, an obstruction to the knee to the knee space of the low one. So um, besides the walls that they built, see how they have wing walls? Those became cane detection. So they didn't really even need that those cane detectable aprons were overkill because they had the, cane, the little wing walls on either side of the drinking fountains. Also, one of the things that they um, would be able to use and they didn't even need the walls is if they would have put the two low drinking fountains on outside with the leading edge at 27 inches, which is required for cane detection, but it's also required for your knee clearance, then they could have used the low drinking fountains as their cane detection. So yeah, so those wing walls were, you know, were there and they didn't need the cane detection. And then the, the little low drinking fountains were, could have been their cane detection as well. Okay, some other examples of protruding objects are this in Texas anyway, and I'm assuming the access board and other places might think the same way, but in Texas, we believe that even when the, um, the, this diaper changing counter is on the circulation path to the um, toilet compartment. And if you measure that, if it's four inches, then it's probably okay. But this one's probably more than four inches. As long as the leading edge is, is not at 27 or lower, then it's a protruding object. But most of the time, if I'm in a hurry, I'm a mom, I'm changing diapers, I'm going to change it, and I'm probably not going to remember to close it. So once I'm, once I'm done changing my baby's diaper, I'm going to leave, leave the diaper counter open. A person who's blind will come in trying to find a, um, their toilet compartment, and they're not going to feel, detect that diaper counter, so it's going to be a protruding object for them. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about operable parts. Operable parts are a little bit complicated because they, it's a component used to, you know, use a insert or withdraw an element, deactivate, deactivate, or adjust. And they have to be the type that is operated with one hand, not required tight grasping and twisting of the wrist, and with an activated force of five pounds. So switches are and they have so they have to be within reach okay so they have to be able to be reached so um so what happens is switches have to be within reach to be able to operate them to, to turn them on and off a rocker switch is the type that you can push the top and the bottom of the switch to operate it right electricians aren't taught this so they always have a rule that they're gonna mount their, sw their switch cover or their uh, any, any um, electrical outlet or anything 48 inches to the middle of the switch or to the middle of the plate cover, uh, the cover plate, sorry. So that makes a problem with rocker switches because if I push the middle, it's not gonna activate the switch. The, the really the operable part is the top and the bottom of the rocker switch. So you have to keep in mind when, you, when your electrical engineer is, um, I know they don't even have this note probably, but you should in your drawings, make sure you under, they, they know that the light switch should be mounted and you can tell them top of the, of, the, of the cover plate instead of at the middle of the cover plate. If they put it 48 inches to the top of the cover plate, then that would make everything lower than 48 inches and we're safe. Something else to keep in mind is when you specify, you're gonna be, you have to beware of cut sheets. 
your the manufacturers want to sell units and so they'll stick that little ada symbol in anything they can because if they say well if you mount it at this height then it's going to be fine well they have to keep in mind it's not just the mounting height it's the operable part that needs to comply this unit requires tight grasping and twisting of the wrist and i bet you it's harder than five pounds. I've tried to use it and I it's harder, harder than five pounds. So this is not a compliant unit. So you wanna make sure you are aware of the rules. So when you see that, don't specify it, even if it says that it's ADA compliant. Same thing with this unit. This unit was a type that required tight grasping and pulling and the, the manufacturer tells you that it's ADA compliant, but it's really not. The operable part is not compliant. Okay. Let's talk quickly about grab bars. So grab bars, there's a side grab bar and a rear grab bar. The side grab bar is required to be 40, uh, 54 inches from the rear wall to the edge of the grab bar. This one, sadly, they put this beautiful mosaic, but the, the contractor didn't put it at 54 inches from the rear wall. They put it six inches from the rear wall to the edge, which gave me only 50 inches of length. So they had to tear up all this beautiful mosaic and redo that grab bar. I was very upset that they, I had to make them do that. <laughs> so um, also something else to keep in mind about grab bars is you, you have to have a gripping surface for a person to use it. And if you mount something below the grab bar, you should have one and a half inches of of space for, for them to grip. And if you mount something above the grab bar, um, then it has to be 12 inches of, of um, image. So this one is a, a toilet paper dispenser that was mounted above the grab bar and it was only three inches from the edge. So that was wrong, they had to move it down. But then there was this dispenser or this disposal, um, feminine napkin disposal that they added below. So it was a little bit tricky. So they, they had to figure that out. Um, same thing with the tank. If you use a tank um, type of toilet, then you wanna make sure that there is enough room between the top of the tank and the bottom of your grab bar to be able to grip it. And again, the, um, we talked about the clearances. The 60 inch minimum clearance is required at a lavatory, at a water closet without any obstruction. So sometimes they build the cabinet, the base cabinet is fine, but then the overhang of the counter is beyond the six inches. So it gives you beyond the, the face of the, um, the base cabinet. So you wanna make sure that you are, the obstruction is really the counter, not the base cabinet, because it's gonna have an overhang. So whatever makes it most narrow. So the, you know, your dimension should be to the counter, not to the base cabinet, unless it's flush. Um, hard wall compartments are um, something that, that people misunderstand a lot. So toilet compartments are the ones that are within a toilet room. If I have a toilet room and I have multiple um, toilets and they're enclosed either with, you know, compartments that are like one inch thick or, and then they hover above the floor or they are compartments that have floor to ceiling walls, they're still compartments. They're still considered toilet compartments, not toilet rooms. You, uh, you know, unless you have a separate hallway with multiple single user toilet rooms, that's fine. But if it's inside a toilet, a restroom, and you have multiple stalls, even if they have hard walls, they are still compartments. So you have to have toe clearances at the toilet. So you have to have nine inches of height for adults, 12 inches for children. And they have to be able to put their, their toes six inches beyond that partition. So if you have a toilet compartment that is floor to ceiling, you, you don't have toe clearance. So they do allow you to have no toe clearance, but if you don't have toe clearance, you have to make it bigger. So you basically take the six inches that you were required to have as beyond the partition, you can bring it inside. So instead of 60 inches of width, at the compartment, you need to make it 66 minimum. Okay, and so that's actually what, or 62, 65 feet by 66 or whatever, depending on what type of um, toilet you have. Okay, handrails at ramps need to extend 
beyond parallel to the path of travel. So something like this is not allowed to be, uh, unless it's a hazard, it's an existing condition and it's a hazard. So you're, you are allowed to do that only in an existing condition and an alteration. If it's new construction, it's not. So you have to do 12 inches on the top and the bottom and it has to be parallel to the path of travel. Okay, this is my, my favorite one to teach. Don't use maximums and minimums. <laughs> they, they, um, that's what we like to do, right? If it says 34 inches maximum, that's what we do, 34 inches. So what happens is that there's no, like I told you before, there's no tolerances. So then there's mistakes that happen in the field and there's always mistakes that happen in the field. So this is a door and thankfully they got me out here before they build it. They, they, it was a preliminary inspection. So it's not, they're not finished with construction. So I measured it and it was 17 inches. So they're gonna say, well, it's just an inch off. It's no big deal. No, it is a big deal because they give you a range. The, that 18 inch minimum is a range. Um, and so you're, it's already, the tolerances are built in. So you can make it 19 or you can make it 18 and a half. If there's an issue with a column or something and you can add, then, you know, then it's, an, it's a different issue. But when we're designing, we can, we can modify things on, on paper uh, much easier than in the field. So make sure that we're understanding that that dimension doesn't have to be the minimum. Same thing with um, protruding objects. This one happened to be four and three quarters. Um, and so then they're like, well, it's only three quarters of an inch off. And it's like, yeah, but you know, uh, the person who, who's uh, disabled doesn't really know that. <laughs> so so we, we just wanna make sure that we're not following the maximums and the minimums. Same thing with here, this is 53 inches instead of 54 inches. So, um, so that's, that was the issue. Same thing with counters. Okay, so counters have to be 34 maximum. So that means it could be lower. It could be 33 inches, you know, and that's okay. As long as you have your knee clearance, um, you can have it lower than 34. Very good. So that the reason why we're designing this, now that I've frustrated you <laughs> with all these details, the reason why we're doing it is because we want to encourage the, and promote the rehabilitation of people with disabilities, right? We want to make sure that we eliminate unnecessary architectural barriers for them and not restrict the, um, the ability to engage in gainful occupation. Plus we wanna not restrict the ability to achieve maximum personal independence. We all wanna be autonomous and not be a burden and people with disabilities have the same need. So I am, um, that's my presentation. I'm happy to take questions if you have any. I'm, I think I allowed you guys to, um, to I, um, let's see, you can, you basically can unmute yourselves if you want. Let me see if there's any questions on the chat. Okay, so what if you note that it is a maximum or minimum? Yeah, so Samantha, you said, what if you note that it's a maximum or minimum? Correct, you're absolutely right. And that's on them. So, right, so that's on the contractor. But so you wanna make sure you do that. But if you give them a little bit more guidance and give them a little bit, a, a different dimension that you know would work, that's a little bit easier, but yes, absolutely. Um, let's let me go back and to some questions. Let's see. Um, so from the beginning, okay. So it says um, Stephanie is coming from a multifamily perspective, but I've heard user passage defined was any door you walk through. Yes, that's exactly right. So any door you walk through. And even if you're not in a wheelchair, that is exactly user passage. That's that's correct. And I didn't think it that way. I was thinking of just a user, meaning a person in a wheelchair, but that's not true. Um, let me see. What are your thoughts on baby changing counters behind the doors? That's actually what I tell my clients to do. So if you put the baby counter, baby changing counter behind the door, there they have to close it to exit, right? So that would be ideal. So if you have enough room for behind the door, that's where I would recommend that you put them. So um, only in a single user restroom though. If you put them behind the door in a multi-user, multi then a person could open the door, right? And then hit you behind the door. I'm gonna stop sharing because I can, so I can see you. So, um, so basically the, if you, if you put them behind the door in a multi-user restroom, and a person opens the door, they're gonna hit you. So in a single user restroom where you can lock the door behind you, for sure put it behind the door because that's, that's 
you know, better for people that want to exit or whatever. Um, so let's see what other questions. When you need greater than 17 inches floor space, can you just make it up with the toe space or do you need to increase the knee clearance? Um, they Because they really want the knee clearance to be more than, look, if you already have your eight inches and 11 inches minimum for knee clearance, you can make the toe clearance a little deeper, but for reaching purposes, it won't count as toe clearance. It'll just count for your floor space. So that's true. You'll start your, your 30 inch by 40 inch space at the, at the place you're reaching for and then go forward. But make sure you have your minimum th um, amount for your knee clearance. Um, and, then, um, and then you can give that extra space beyond the, the compartment or the partition or whatever. That, that apron, sorry. Trying to stand in the pathway and change a diaper is no fun. Yeah, <laughs> Mary Beth, yeah. Um, when designing clearances, should we be counting turning radii and maneuvering clearance to the wall finish or base? I usually do it to the base. So she's asking, Marissa said, that do, we, do we measure to the wall or to the base? Technically, it could be to the wall, but the, we think about the way that the person in a wheelchair uses the space and they're gonna be using it at the floor, right? So the base is the way I typically would like to, to measure because yeah, they could probably do it, but it's a little bit more tricky. So let, let, let's uh, let's make, make it a habit to dimension to the base and not to the wall. And it has to be finishes, right? To the fin, not the not the stud and not all that. What if you note know that it's yeah, we already talked about that. When do you need to provide ADA counters in business occupancies for employees? Great question, Shelly. Um, work areas are exempted. And so that only when you hire someone in a wheelchair or that needs it, you would make the work area, but not every employee area is a work area. So things that are not work related, for example, a break room sink or a, um, a, a fixed counter where they eat their lunch, those are not work related. So those have to comply. Um, things like a coffee, a copy room that, that has a counter or a, a, a work related, a work room that has a counter, those don't have to comply, but only the ones that are not work related have to comply. I hope I, hope I answered that one. Um, let's see, are you able to share the PowerPoint? Yes, so send me, tell me your email and I'm happy to email you the PowerPoint and the certificates as well. Um, any other questions? This has been a great, oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, Let's see, any other questions? Can a counter be 36 inches if there's no fixtures to be reached? If a counter has a sink, it has to have 34 inches. If a counter doesn't have a sink and there's nothing for us to reach, then there's then you don't have to make it 34 inches. So that's true. So um, it's one o'clock or 12 o'clock based on where you are. I'm happy to stay a little longer for any questions, but I appreciate you having me and I look forward to having you, you know, see you again in the chat or in the group. Um, and uh, let's see, there's new messages. So let me see. I have a client with an exterior access only restroom for their employees. Uh oh. So Krista, it's not equal access. You know, if they if they're making every well, if all employees have to go out, then that's fine. But if it's just people with disabilities have to go out, then it's not not good. But um, for sure. If, if it's equal access, then you know what? <laughs> you could uh, take it up with your boss, you know, that they have the restrooms to go outside. So, um, okay, so I think I got almost all. If I didn't answer your question, let me know. Um, here's one, another one. Leanne says, what are the ADA requirements for commercial kitchens? No requirements for commercial kitchens. Those are work areas and they're, re they're not required to comply. Unless they're ones, commercial kitchens that are, that are like in a church and it's open to anyone and anyone can rent it out, then it becomes a public accommodation. But if it's part of a work area, then it's not required to comply. Um, so let's see, any, any other ones? Okay, very good, awesome. So, um, so the, oh, sorry, Mary Beth, 34 inches to the top of the sink. Okay, so if you have, a counter and then you have a, a, a sink that's a little higher than the counter, it's to the top of the sink or the lavatory. 
And if you have a vessel sink, that's even more complicated. You want to make sure that it's at the top of the vessel sink and you have to have knee clearance. So you make sure, make sure you, you can recess it into the counter. Sometimes I've done that. So um, that kind of thing. Very good. Um, all right. Well, have a great day, guys. If you want to unmute and ask me a question that I didn't answer or that I missed, let me know. I'll, I'll be happy to stick around for a few more minutes. So any, any other questions? Okay. Hey, Marcy. Yes. Yeah, this is Shelly. Um, back to the counter height for work areas. If I have exam rooms and like a business occupancy. Great idea. Great question. Okay. Okay. Exam rooms are a little bit of a hybrid, right? So an exam yeah. room is half of it is for the patients, which is a public right. accommodation, and half of it is for the doctors and nurses. If your sink it's not being used by the patient. Like for example, if you have an optometrist office and you're making them put on their contacts at that sink, then it's not required to comply. Meaning the opposite, right? So that if it's, if it's an exam room where the sink is only used by the doctor and the nurse, then it's a work area and it's not required to comply. But if you're making the, the patient use it either for washing their hands or brushing their teeth or putting on contacts, then it's, then it's a public accommodation and it has to comply. So it depends on what kind of exam room it is. Right, right. Okay, that makes sense. And then the same thing with like um, the lab areas, yep. you know, where they're testing. The lab sample. area, right. If it's not open to the public, if it's a lab for the workers, for the people that work in that lab, then it's, a, and even in, a, even in, in a university level, by the way, so if you're that's having a regular, it's a, if it's a university and it's a grad student that's using a lab and they're, and it's part of their, their job, if they were hired to be in this lab for research or whatever, that's still a work area. If it's a class that where they're interacting and it's a science lab, then it's a, then it's a lab that requires knee space. But if it's a lab in a university level for grad students that are hired to do research, then they're considered employees of the university and they're not required to, to have the, um, unless they have that need and then they have to make accommodations. If it's a public university, they have, they're under title two, they have to provide it. But, but if it's, if they're considered employees of the university or of the hospital or of the clinic, then it's that lab is not a public accommodation. Okay, so then you just have to make a reasonable accommodation if one is hired. If, right, if. Ah, perfect. That, okay, that explains it so much better. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Any, any other questions that I can answer? I've got one. Okay. Um, so I have a um, historic 1910 uh, school building. Goody. And there's existing non-compliant restrooms, obviously. Yes. Um, on one floor. Um, and then on, on two, it's a three-story building. So on two other floors, we are adding compliant restrooms. Um, if they wanted to replace just the fixtures on those non-compliant restrooms, would that trigger making them compliant? Right. So it, okay. So that's a great question. It's very, it's kind of tricky because if there's an opportunity, okay, if the room is tiny and there's no opportunity, then the fixtures won't trigger because it depends on why you're doing it. Is it maintenance because they're old and they don't work? Then it's not considered an alteration according to the to the ADA. So then it, you could claim that it's it's maintenance and that's why you're you're replacing the fixtures. If it's not maintenance, if it's because those fixtures are ugly and you want to put a new fixture, then we have to think about how much can you do. I mean, if it's technically infeasible, where you would have to tear up walls. And, um, so technically infeasible set in the, um, or readily achievable, is it readily achievable? Is, is it, it's, if it's too expensive or if it's structurally impracticable or if you're by, or let's do another one, if you have a multi-user restroom and the only way to do that is to reduce your fixture count, then those are technically infeasible. So alterations, you have to kind of see who, it, who is your AHJ, what state are you? Uh, Oregon and the AHJ honestly is uh, more than lenient to the point that we 
you know, are uncomfortable with uh, the, our, the status of our uh, license and whatnot. Right. No, your license is not in play. Okay. So the, again, these are, these requirements, the ADA lawsuits do not mess with your license. Your it's the the public accommodation is the one responsible. So they're the ones that are going to be sued over. And you're 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 doing your due diligence. You're doing the best you can, and you, with what you're working with. So your license is not at play. Okay. So then nobody's going to get you know this architect's license away because we didn't build a proper handicap um, or disabled the restroom. People couldn't but, report us for not doing. Oh. Okay. No, because there's no, for example, in Texas, I'm going to tell you in Texas, we have the, our Texas Ar Architectural Examiners Board, and we have a law that says our architects and designers have to submit drawings for review. That's our only requirement, our only responsibility. So once we do that, the design doesn't have to be right for us to meet the law. And so we, I mean, obviously we want to do the right thing. But it doesn't, they, they won't go to the licensing board and say, hey, this architect did it wrong and take away her license or, or fine her. That's not part of the law. I mean, we, we'll do, so if you don't feel comfortable, Samantha, if you feel comfortable doing it a little bit more than what the HJ wants you to do, then I would do the, the, the most you can do. So if, if the room is big enough to add a grab bar, then I would add the grab bar. If it's not wide enough for you to make the clearance work, then I wouldn't worry. If you can figure out another place to put and you know, without ruining the historic nature, this is another thing. Historic buildings are more, you're more lenient with them because you don't want to ruin the historic nature of the building. So the SHPO or whoever agency you're dealing with is going to be a little bit more, um, you know, they're wanting you to stay with the historic nature versus the ADA. The ADA doesn't trump it. So right. in this case, the, the bathrooms are, you know, from the fifties and they are not pretty at all. So it doesn't right. really. <laughs> right. So I would say do the best you can um, and document, tell your, the owner of the building to document what you've done and what you can and can't do. And when it's, when it's readily achievable for them to do more than they can. And then the department of justice, that's how they want to see it. If, the, if somebody you know, goes and complains to the Department of Justice, who regulates these things, by the way, and they say, this, this historic building is not accessible, you can have it in, or they, the owner should have it written down that they are aware that this is not accessible and that they plan to make accommodations at the state or when they're readily achievable so that you, they, they know that you're not ignoring it. And, um, and that's what I would recommend. Just keep, keep a tally of what you know is not right and that let them make sure that they, in the future, fix it. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else have any questions? Okay, so very good. Thank you so much for having me. And I will um, send the, um, the, I'll probably post the recording if you're my, I'll post the recording and I'll send you guys the PowerPoint presentation. I'm gonna stop the recording now and stop the live stream. I'll stop the recording.